let's talk about the individual types of gates. So let's start with the simplest type of gate, and that's a gate for one qubit only. So the general form is you have an, a qubit coming in in the state psi. You have uh, a single qubit gate. Here it's labeled with a U. That's, the, that's some unitary transformation on the single qubit. The output is then the transformed qubit state. And let me show you a few examples that are used very often. The first example are the so-called Pauli gates. Yeah, they denote, denoted X, Y, Z. Yeah, for example, the Pauli X gate is a gate which applies the Pauli X operator to the single qubit state. We learned last week that the Pauli operators, they are at the same time ob uh, observable, they are Hermitian, but they are also unitary. Yeah? So the Pauli operator also performs a unitary transformation. And um, here is the Pauli X. The action on a basis state is that it flips the basis state. So the basis state one is transformed to basis state zero and vice versa. A compact way of writing this is to say if the input is a basis state T, where T is zero or one, then the output is, is T plus one mod two. Yeah, so if the input uh, is the basis state zero, then zero plus one is one, so the output state is one. If the input state is the basis state one, then the output is one plus one is two, mod two is zero. Yeah, so it flips basis state, and that's why the Pauli X gate is the, quant uh, is the quantum counterpart, the quantum analog of the classical not gate. Another example is the Pauli Z gate. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Pauli uh, Z matrix is a diagonal and it has entries one and minus one. So this means that the basis state zero is mapped to basis state zero and the basis state one is mapped to base is to minus ba basis state one. So the Pauli Z gate gives a factor um, minus one if we if we have basis state one then and here it's written in a compact form it's a prefactor minus one to the power t this is uh, plus one if we have basis state zero and it's minus one if we have basis state one a further single qubit gate which is used very often and here is the first time we encounter the um the pertinent operator, that's the so-called Hadamard gate. It's written with an, with an H. And it maps the basis state zero to the plus state. If you remember from last, um, from last week, the plus state was this superposition of zero and one. And on the Bloch sphere, where we have the basis state zero at the North Pole, the basis state one at the South Pole, and here we have the X, Y, and Z axes, then the plus state is the state on the equator of the Bloch sphere on the x-axis. And then at the opposite end, um, we have the minus state. The minus state is a superposition with a minus in between. Yeah, so these are 
remember the, this is an alternative basis in the qubit in the hilbert space of one qubit and what the hadama gate does is it maps the basis state zero to the plus state and the basis state one to the minus state so essentially it rotates the basis in the single qubit hilbert space it rotates it maps from the standard basis zero one to the plus minus basis the matrix representation of the hadamard operator in the standard basis has this form uh, you can easily recognize the first column that's the with entries one one that's the image of the basis state zero and so it's um, um with the prefactor one over square root of two that's precisely this linear combination uh one over square root two zero plus one so that's the plus state and the second column um with the minus uh, below that's the minus state so this is another very important single qubit gate then there are two others which are used a bit uh, more rarely, but they are still important. One is the so-called phase gate. It's um, matrix representation in the standard basis is diagonal with entries one and I. And then there's the so-called pi eight gate T, which looks very similar, but instead of the I has a, an E to the I pi quarter. Uh, don't ask me why it's called the pi 8 gate, but in the matrix you have pi quarters. Maybe if you factor out a global phase factor, then um, e to the i pi 8, then in the diagonal you have e to the minus i pi 8 and e to the plus i pi 8. Maybe that's where it comes from. So this list shows you sort of the, the most frequently used single qubit gates. And they are not all, uh, and they are all different. And in principle, you have um, infinitely many of them because you have a continuum of possible unitary transformations of a single qubit. And this contrasts with the classical case where practically you have only one interesting single bit gate, and that's the not gate. Yeah? So if you have Classically, you have just one, and here you have infinitely many. However, it turns out, that's what I mentioned previously, that um, actually just a few are enough to build arbitrary circuits. The gates that I just showed you, they are not all independent, but they, there are relationships between them. For example, two Hadama gates in a row, they just give the identity. That's because the Hadama operator is like the, all the Pauli operators, its square is the unit operator. Uh, H squared is unit operator, so two Hadama operators in sequence neutralize each other. Now let's uh, now consider this, uh, this next sequence. We have a Hadama gate followed by a Pauli X gate and then another Hadama gate. Imagine that you start with a basis state zero. Then the Hadama gate transforms that to the plus state, okay? <clears throat> the plus state, remember, is this linear combination of zero and one. Then the Pauli X flips the basis states. So um, zero, becomes one, 
and one becomes zero. But in the bracket, we still have the same, the same sum, and just the order is uh, exchanged, but it doesn't do anything. So actually, the plus state is an eigenstate of Pauli x. It remains unchanged. And then the final Hadamard gate transforms the plus state back to the basis state zero. Why is that? We can quickly check that. I mean, um, uh, it follows from the fact that um, uh, Hadamard squared is the unit operator. So the Hadamard operator is its own inverse. Yeah, so the second Hadamard simply reverses the transformation from zero to plus, and then it goes back to zero. Uh, I can also make this explicit. Um, so here we are inputting this linear combination. When we apply Hadamard to that, then uh, zero becomes plus, one becomes minus. Yeah. And then we remember the definition of plus and minus. So we get another factor one over square root of two. And then we have zero plus one. And uh, the minus is zero, zero minus one. The ones cancel, we get twice basis state zero and the two cancels and we end up with basis state zero. So um, this combination of three gates leaves the basis state zero unchanged. Let's do the same um, for basis state one. Then Hadamar transforms this to the minus state. Then Pauli x, well, what the minus state is this expression down here, but with a minus sign. Pauli x flips the basis state. So then after Pauli x, we have one minus zero. This is up to a sign that's the minus state. Yeah? So here after Pauli x, we have minus the minus state. And then we have the final Hadamar gate. Hadamar transforms the minus state back to basis state one. So in the end, we have minus basis state one. Okay. So in sum, um, basis state zero is mapped to itself. Basis state one is mapped to minus basis state one. That's exactly the action of the Pauli Z gate. So um, the combination of three, th these three gates is, has the same effect as the Pauli Z gate. You can also show the same result simply by multiplying the respective matrices, and then you get as a result the Pauli Z matrix. The combination of Hadamar, Pauli Z, and Pauli, and another Hadamar. Well, you can just take the previous identity and, and add from the left and the right two more Hadamar gates, uh, one from each side. Then on the left hand, on the right hand side, you get precisely that combination Hadamar, Z, Hadamar. And on the left hand side, you have Hadamar, Hadamar, X and then two Hadamars, but the two Hadamars, they cancel each other. That's what we saw at the very beginning. So on the left-hand side, you have only Pauli X left over. So this combination of three gates gives the Pauli X. And then I show you two more, um, two phase gates in a row gives give the Pauli Z and two pi over eight 
over eight uh, gates give a phase gate. You can see the latter two relations simply by looking at the matrices, and um, it's quite simple. You just take the square of the matrices, and you get um, the matrices that correspond to the gate on the right-hand side. Now, in addition to these unitary gates, uh, for single qubits, there is one type of gate which is really unique to a quantum computer. You don't have something similar in the classical case, and that's the measurement gate. Yeah, we, I said that in order to extract a classical result from a quantum computation, you have to do a measurement. That's something that you don't have to worry about in, in the classical computer. But in a quantum computer, you have to make that explicit, and there is an extra gate for that, and it's denoted with this symbol, which looks like a measurement instrument. It has a, as its input a qubit, so a quantum state, and the output, and then you perform a measurement in the standard basis, and the output is then um, one of the two possible results, either the result corresponding to the basis state zero or the result corresponding to the basis state one. So the output is a zero or a one, and that's a classical bit. Yeah. So the measurement gate basically ends the, the quantum domain and then translates a quantum bit into a classical bit. I mentioned before, this is a step which in general is probabilistic and irreversible, unless you know for sure in advance that the quantum state that's coming in is a basis state. In that case, the measurement result is certain. And also, if you know that, that it's a basis state, then from the result, you can um, infer which basis state it was. But leaving aside the special case, this is probabilistic and irreversible. 